Hello everyone, welcome back to another video. Today we're going to talk about how to sleep train your baby and oh is this one a doozy. But don't worry, by the end of this video you should have all the information you need to start or continue sleep training your child with confidence. By the way, since I don't have a bunch of footage of my son sleeping, because I don't sit in his room at night with a video camera, instead while I'm talking I'm going to show you some clips of him just playing and being cute. Now, as with most of our videos on this channel, I'm tackling this topic using a one-two combination of my own personal experience paired with copious amounts of research. So I'll warn you as usual that I'm not a doctor or a sleep expert or even a baby expert. I just do a lot of thinking and studying when it comes to raising my son, and my wife does too, and so we created this channel to help other parents by sharing our experiences and doing all the research so you don't have to. So please like this video and subscribe if you'd enjoy watching others like it. So sleep training. It is such a tough thing. I would go so far as to say it is one of the most emotionally taxing things that I've ever had to do. The first thing I need you to understand about sleep training is that there is no silver bullet. It takes time and it takes conviction. Nor can you begin sleep training right away. During the first few months of your child's life, it's entirely normal for everyone in the house to be sleep deprived and to be on a crazy haphazard schedule. There's really no getting around that. It's once your child hits about six months of age that most experts recommend you begin the process of sleep training. This is something I agree with and something we found to be true because your baby needs to have developed a certain cognitive capacity before they're capable of being sleep trained. For us, there was a lot of trial and error, there were a lot of mistakes made, and so my hope today is that we can help you avoid those same pitfalls and eliminate some of the stress and frustration you may be feeling as you walk through this process with your child. Now, maybe you've already done some reading or watched some videos about the many different sleep training methods out there, and there are a lot of them. They include the Ferber method, the chair method, the fading method, and the so-called no cry or no tears method, which you can't see me right now, but I'm air quoting because the term no tears is quite the misnomer, actually, and we'll talk about why in a minute. Right now, I want you to forget everything you've read or seen or heard about sleep training methods, okay? Because we're going to drill down to the core of what sleep training is really about. What we didn't understand when we first started down the path of sleep training was the science behind it. And in order to understand what sleep is like for your child, let's first think about what sleep is like for us as adults. When you roll over in the middle of the night and maybe you wake up briefly and you pull up the covers and fall back asleep, you probably don't realize it, but that's a skill. You learned it so long ago and you've been doing it for most of your life, so it has probably never registered to you in that way. But like any other skill in your life, it's one that's gotten better with practice. That ability to wake up, to realize you're awake, to be calm, and know that everything's all right. I don't need, you know, mommy or daddy to rush in and help me and then to fall back asleep on your own. That is a technique that babies are not born knowing how to do. It's called self-soothing and babies do not naturally possess this ability. It's something they have to learn. And that is all sleep training really is. So now we understand that all those different methods we talked about a minute ago are working to achieve the exact same thing, which is to develop your child's skill of self-soothing. It's like a diet, right? There are tons of different diets out there, but they all have the goal of getting you into better physical shape. So as a parent, the single most important thing you should understand as you sleep train is that the end goal is that your child acquires that new skill. When you leave them crying in their crib, and yes, I know how hard it is, as I alluded to earlier in the video, you are not breaking them, you're not damaging them, you are not tormenting them. What you're doing is teaching them. And like I said, we didn't do everything right in those early days of parenthood. In fact, we definitely didn't do things right. We just loved holding Xander so much and he was so stinking cute that before long he got used to falling asleep on us because we just wanted to soak up as many of those snuggles as we could. And so we paid the price later when it came time to start getting him used to falling asleep on his own. And so for us it finally got to the point where we were up six, ten, a dozen times a night and we just looked at each other and said, this is it. This is interfering with our lives, with our work, with our baby's mood the following day, with our moods the following day, because of all this up and down during the night, and we knew something had to change. 
Once we learned how self-soothing works, that it is a skill that needs to be developed, everything changed. We had two, maybe three, just super hardcore nights where my wife hid in the basement because she just couldn't handle hearing our son cry. And I stayed and gritted my teeth and kept repeating to myself, you are not a terrible dad, you are not a terrible person, and I listened out and did periodic check-ins and so forth. And then things got better. We were surprised, in fact, by how quickly they got better. Your child will learn to self-soothe. Every child does. The only question you need to ask yourself is how long is it going to take? Because the difference between giving your family a good night's sleep and not is whether or not you're going to choose to give your baby the opportunity to learn. Or if you're going to stand in the way by picking them up and rocking them to sleep every time they cry during the night. All you're doing at that point is teaching them to rely on you instead of being self-reliant for comfort. So in regards to that whole no cry or no tears method I mentioned earlier, the reason that's a misnomer is because it doesn't actually mean your baby doesn't cry. In fact, it's pretty much the same technique as the Ferber or the cry it out method, but with shorter time intervals where you go in and give them a quick touch and a soothing word and then leave. Because if you think about it, at the moment you put your baby down to sleep, there are only two things that really matter. One, are they awake? And two, if they are awake, are they comfortable being separated from you? If not, there are probably going to be tears. Early on, our son Xander was never okay with us leaving him, and it's likely that the same could be true for your baby. Because at first, we were trying all these different methods, and we didn't have the guts to stick to any of them because we felt like absolute monsters, leaving our child in his crib, wailing and screaming for comfort from the very people he was supposed to trust to provide for his every need. And because we didn't understand that letting him learn was helping, not hurting, this dragged on for months. Maybe that's where you're at right now. Maybe that's why you're watching this video. If so, here's the bottom line on sleep training. It's gonna be hard. As I said earlier, there's no silver bullet. It's gonna make you feel like a villain. And that is a fact that as a parent, you're just gonna have to come to grips with. The sooner you do that, the better it will be for everyone involved, I promise. But you're also gonna need to give yourself a break. Cut yourself some slack. Show yourself a little grace, because this thing that you're doing that makes you feel like a terrible human being is the only way to achieve some level of peace and to help your child grow. So I would say that overall the method we used was closest to probably the Ferber, but again it doesn't really matter because the end goal is the same. Even after those first couple of awful nights when things get better and your baby is crying for shorter and shorter periods of time, sleep progressions still do occur, and that's partly because your baby's growing so much during that first year. 90% of our brains are developed by age five, so your baby is going through a lot of changes in very quick succession. That does not mean your sleep training isn't working. It just means that maybe your child is gonna need some extra support at certain times more than others. One thing you can do early on to help is to develop a bedtime routine, whether that includes bath time or story time or singing lullabies or teeth brushing once they have some teeth. Some type of structure to let them know it's bedtime and if it's the same routine or close to the same, every night that will help prepare them for what's coming. Things will also tend to improve as your child gets older and starts to gain a little more independence. Once Xander hit his first birthday, it got to the point where we could give him some freedom in terms of letting him decide how he wanted to spend his own time. So we would say, okay, it's time for night night. We're gonna put you in your crib, but if you want, you can stay up for a little while and play with your stuffed animals or read your books. Now granted, this was after he was old enough to have that stuff in his crib with him. I definitely don't recommend doing this when your baby's an infant. They should of course have no blankets, no pillows, no plushies, nothing else in the crib with them until they're old enough to move around on their own. And you can check out our six stages of crawling video for more on that. One last piece of advice I'll leave you with is that I know that sometimes it can be easy to get discouraged. You're already sleep deprived and you've got to be up for work and here you are trying to rock your baby to sleep at 3 a.m. for the fourth time tonight. So whenever I felt myself getting frustrated, I would try to take a step back and remember that my son isn't always going to need me. And when I think about that and about what it means to be needed, and what it means to let yourself be needed, I often find it changes my perspective. To me, perspective means seeing the positives in an otherwise bad situation. 
if where you are now is tiring and strenuous and you're at your wit's end, there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with admitting it. But even in our worst moments as parents, we need to remember that when those moments are over, they're gone. When my son's 16, he's not going to be crying out for comfort from Dada when he wakes up in the middle of the night. At least I hope not. But this time that we have with our children, this right now, it's the only right now we're going to get. Now, I don't say that to be dour or grim. I say it because cherishing each little moment is no less important just because maybe it is not our best moment. And yes, being needed is inconvenient sometimes. It's not fun sometimes, but it can also be pretty wonderful if you let it. Well, folks, that's it for this video. I really hope you got something out of it. If you did, if even one or two things I said stuck with you, I hope you'll give this video a like. It really does help. And if you're a parent who wants to learn more about navigating the complex waters of child rearing, please consider subscribing for lots more advice, tips, and perspective on modern parenthood. Thanks for watching.